Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be moderating along with Andy Anderson tonight. And uh, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. Number one, we have our speaker who speaks. I mean, I'm sorry, we have a brief announcements period first. Then we get into our main presentation. Then we have a questions period after the presentation. Let's uh, give a rousing round of applause for our speaker tonight. College regular Charlie Paydock had over three at over three thousand years of uprisings and insurrections that led to social and economic change. The French Revolution is regarded as the first modern revolution because it changed the structure of society rather than simply replacing the existing ruler or even the political regime. Let's welcome Mr. Charlie Paydock. All right. Commandante. The commandante, please, if you please, the commandante. <laughs> all right, uh, welcome and thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, this is going to be a three-part presentation. I'm going to review the situations that give rise uh, to revolutions of a poli-sci kind of perspective. The middle part will be a review of the significant revolution, revolution, revolutions which have taken place over time around the world with particular emphasis on the details of the French Revolution considered the most pivotal and significant one to ever have taken place among historians and reviewing it myself I could see its significance and the third part is is the United States on the precipice of revolution itself so I will let you at that point decide Okay, let's begin. Uh, the topic tonight is social change. Uh, and uh, the thing is, once these six the right circumstances come together, it's been said by Chavez that once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. You cannot uneducate the person who has learned to read. You cannot humiliate the person who feels pride. You cannot oppress the people who are not afraid anymore. We'll see if this is that true to the case. I can assure you from my study of this, that revolutions, the one thing I want to convey to you, we try to think they're spontaneous things that are beginning to end point A to point B in a relatively quick period of time. You could not, in fact, be more wrong. These take decades of formation and execution to conclusion, as you will see on many of these. And uh, really, just like one set in motion, though, I don't think you can ever particularly cap it. OK, the next one in groups. OK, now this is the only one that I'm going to have that's got any significant detail to it. But what are the revolutions are major turning points in history? And regardless of where they occur, some common factors are present. There's a great divide between the classes. There is a crisis which negatively impacts the masses. There's a loss of faith in government. And the other thing is a basic desire for independence. And last of all, philosophies which provide a common rallying ground. And we'll see if these features are common to all of them. Okay, now the basic question we'll try to answer at this part is what will cause people to revolt? Do you like to get one of those on the top? Do you want one of those on the bottom? All right, the major thing, it's common feature of all of these is social stratification. A division between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots. You can see here, your settler theory is Andrew Carnegie there. Yeah. Um, Anyhow, social stratification, uh, and if I'm correct, the United States right now has the greatest social, social stratification of any country in the history of the world, just about. All right, now this is another thing. There's an article on the website on, for, for July. You can read this article. But there's arguments that in, regarding the stratification, that income inequality is the destroyer of civilizations. <coughs> This is the one thing you really want to avoid. And the, the assertion is 
at least by one writer or author, is that it cannot be mitigated by policy, but it's mitigated only by upheaval or revolution. And I will see if you, if you agree or not. Okay, some of the crisis impacting the masses, we'll see in many of these, you know, were basic food. In the French Revolution, it was bread. When Lenin returned to, and was uh, heading up the revolution in, in Russia, he said, what did he say he promised the people? Uh, land, bread, and peace. You know, the other thing are closures. If the economy is in disarray, the crisis, certainly a depression, or mass unemployment. You end up like this woman here, look at, where's my, like, yeah. yeah, like this, you know. The masses, you're not going to control them at that point. Okay, now here's what the, the authorities are always going to tell you this. Keep calm and follow the rules. Yeah, that's you guys, right here. You're right, get in line, one after another, like the elephants in the circus. That's, what they are. that's it, you know. Okay, the other, another factor, is loss in faith of the government. And conceivably, historically, I cannot think of anyone who lost more faith in government than the, the Tsar of Russia. Uh, the people completely had no, talk about polls or ratings, he, he had an unfavorable rating of the magnitude of like 1,000%. It just it was unbelievable. I also came across this thing regarding losses. Here's another disposed guy, uh, King Wilhelm II of Germany. Actually, I found this rather enlightening, and I found some parallels to the situation in the United States today. But you can read, he was a compulsive speech, speech maker. He straight off script and said all kinds of loony things. Uh, he denounced the party, a certain segment of the society, his society is a gang of traitors. Uh, well, he sent out photos of himself whenever he could. Uh, I guess he wanted to get publicity. But I like the last two of these. He read very little apart from newspaper cuttings about himself. <laughs> Who does this remind you of? And, and his ministers resorted to manipulation, distraction, and flattery to manage him. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, I'll take one look at the guys are the, uh, he's long gone from now. Now another common feature uh, in many of these situations is the desire for independence from colonization. And of course there was a situation in Algiers, lasted until 1962. Uh, the, uh, you know, one of the amazing thing is when this whole process began, I've often been amazed like this, but England never set about to establish an empire that's been written. It just kind of happened, uh, which may or not be true, but they did make a, certainly, yeah, they made aggressive efforts towards expanding the, the empire and sustaining it and spent considerable resources doing it. Just a little thing there, why I chose the French Foreign Legion. I actually was looking during the week at how you could join the French Foreign Legion. It's not a bad thing. You get you get a complete, everyone who joins gets a completely new identity and French citizenship, so they can't trace it, you know. All right, another thing that precipitates revolutions are challenges to authority by, in, in, this is a fancy term here, indigenous ethnic groups. Anyhow, uh, and this also extends down in certain groups, we'll see later, uh, Creos and Mulatos and things like that. And basically, the Native American Indians would qualify, and certainly, but indigenous people come in. Uh, you know. Actually, I will advance one bit of an argument here. I have read around some things that the colonial powers the colonial powers that ran the colonies were better towards treating indigenous people than the revolutionaries who came afterwards. You could argue about this regarding land in particular, but the colonial powers were, were better 
to the indigenous people than those who replace them. You can argue that all you want. Now certainly philosophies provide a common rallying point. As a young man, I can still recollect sitting in my little new apartment, a freshman in college reading the Communist Manifesto. I said, boy, this is really good stuff. But certainly um, uh, a philosophical framework uh, uh, is the basis of many, and this is one of the influences of the French Revolution is that the, the, the philosophy of that revolution expanded around the world and caused a multitude of issues. Okay, the other thing is that if you go around and if you are in the activist community, is that there are certainly assorted ideologies uh, that are that are pretty on the edge uh, of changing society here. You know, I've been a member of the IWW. They want to take over the entire world. Uh, Refuse fascism is out there. They insist their position is is that the revolution is the only solution to the situation confronting the United States right now. Uh, and these code pink, I won't. I like code pink, but they're just they're just so far out there. That it's a, yeah. <laughs> okay, and there's certainly many other organizations, activist organizations, but they certainly have a more focused point of view, and they're not looking to overthrow the United States. They have their their mission or actions. If you look on their website, you know, like gun sense and Black Lives and uh, increasing the minimum wage. Okay. Now, indoctrination plays the part in every revolution. I don't know about you, but no one is born a revolutionary. Uh, there's a formative period of time, uh, whether or not I think it matter of fact, even the in inclination of most people is to go along with the established order. But nevertheless, there is an indoctrination process of one fashion or another. There are many people, a lot of people are claiming, especially the libertarians, that the educational schools, state-run schools, they've been yapping about this for blah, 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 blah. I'm tired of hearing about it, is that the, the public education is a process uh, for uh, forming obedient subjects to the empire, which I don't know is getting any on. But you got to watch out, especially groups like this College of Complexes. There's no telling what you're going to hear some, some guys. Uh. Anyhow, another along this thing that, that may contribute to a revolutionary posture is inflammatory literature. Um, no doubt if you've ever been to a protest, there's any number of people selling you tabloids of one type or another. I usually buy them. I was asking myself, how many tabloids you got to sell to start a revolution? Uh, but anyhow, our own revolution was was based largely on this piece of inflammatory literature by some guy. I like this. If you look at it, he didn't even put his name on it. That tells you, written by an Englishman. Come on, buddy. Who are you? You know. I've, I common sense, yeah, sure, I'll tell you, common sense is to take something like that and throw it out. All right, the other thing is reading certain publications. Actually, you know, I was looking through my books and I came across a mint, brand new copy of Rules for Radicals, a paperback. But this People's History, oh yeah, that's the favorite of the here. And if I'm correct, that's what the poster says. In Russia, they want you to read and read and read. Yeah, the books they give you will prove. That's why I think that if you don't read, you'll forget, soon forget how to read. So keep reading our stuff. The, um, another aspect of revolutions is that uh, there certainly, certainly are individuals, if you wish to call them, I will identify them as troublemakers, being leaders, ne'er-do-wells, and the other ne'er-do-wells, that's the one I like, uh, but they have something went wrong 
in their upbringing and they have a psychological resistance to any sort of conformity. <laughs> They're out there. Like here, there's a meeting tonight. We showed this movie here, Pleasantville. Even though they lived in Pleasantville, they were not pleasant. <laughs> That's what I mean. Dealing with this. There were some books written about this, most notably brought to mind as I got a degree in this. Um, but Sigmund Freud in the early in the century wrote Civilization and its Discontents. Uh, but there's a desire for individuality regardless of the expectations of society. And it's also a common copy topic I see here. This lefty guy here who's running around all over the place. And now uh, globalization, Timmy. That's got its discontents. I'm not happy with that. <laughs> Anyhow, religiously, from a religious perspective, they tell us what happens to revolutionaries here. Here's what happened to the angels. Lucifer and his bells. They ended up in pandemonium. So the follow scriptures, the advice of scriptures. Uh, this is the one that Andy Anderson's always advocating us to pursue. Uh, they say these are websites for progressives. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, look on this. This is like, who knows what you're going to find on these sites. <laughs> Does anybody discuss? Uh, oh, and this one is absolutely true. Look at this guy. Look at the subjects he's got. Change and all this. Uh, liberal academic. They're in control of the universities. You send your kid there. You see, think I'm going to get learn something here and they just they just like nothing better than they have young minds that they could mold uh, to their ideologies that's that's a given there all right now here's an interesting one is that Trump you're plotting this guy? are you for real yeah, yeah. <laughs> You have to be the only person I've encountered, except for one or two of us. But that tells us rather telling. Uh, anyhow, I came across this, but uh, Trump is complaining about the liberal media. It's unfair. And their inaccuracies and all that. And he says that the news media CNN. It is the enemy of the people. But I, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I seem to recollect, I do recollect, that the major publication in the news media during the French Revolution regarding incendiary journalism, far from being an enemy of the people, their major newspaper was called the friend of the people. Just the opposite. Um, it's a, yeah for the Society of Patriots. Guillotine, Guillotine. Uh, but written by Jean-Paul Marat, we'll see him later. Uh, because it's considered dangerous because of... So you can take Trump who says the media is the enemy of the people, or you can find literature that is your friend. Okay. Now another thing, Andy Edison's also talking about this all the time. I don't know how they completely operate or do this. But there's all sorts of arguments among the lefties that the media is controlled by the, all the corporations. They got, they got you're just like the dog nipper there. That's what, that's what, you turn on the news, you're just like that dog. Okay, another thing, the revolutions will drag you in, is certainly they are on recruitment. Uh, they want you to join, sign up for their website, email list, come to a meeting, uh, this girl's out there is announcing the next meeting at Code Pink. And uh, as I've said many times, if you go to one of these meetings, don't look anyone directly in the eye because they'll try to hypnotize you. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ellen's, Ellen's going to talk about this next week, so I won't steal or sunder. But revolutions have been precipitated, or so they claim, by hidden influences or operatives the CIA, the deep state, and I'm going to let her try to justify her assertions next week on whether or not there's some that think the CIA is responsible for every social uh, uprising uh, since the beginning of time. Uh, certainly there is foreign influence 
and intervention in many revolutions. They're not strictly isolated uh, from the location uh, from which they take place. And you can see here this propaganda, the commies, and they got, they, that's what is this tomorrow. Look at commies taking over. That's what you want, right? <laughs> Let them, yeah. All right, come on in. Uh, there's the seat someplace. Right here, or right over here. Yeah, we got some room. All right. Now, regarding foreign influence and intervention, we had this in the United States. Can anybody tell me, you're adding, who are these two foreigners? The Marquis de Lafayette. Yeah, right. And Who's the other is, guy? Baron you got it. Yeah. Foreign <laughs> intervention. <laughs> Certainly played a part in our revolution. Uh, so it's not necessarily a negative factor. Now, one thing that you're going to find pretty much in virtually every single revolution, though, <laughs> regardless of where and when it takes place, <laughs> is the agent for a lock of Now, I, I also like to point out that a lot of this terminology is French, so you're getting, you're getting to see the influence of the the French with the agents. Provocateur Lenin was shipped into Russia specifically for the purpose of, of, of disrupting that country. They were doing all right without him, and he showed up in that little naked fakir, that Gandhi guy. And the guy in the middle, anybody know who that is? John Brown. Right, exactly. I spent a lot of time in, in, in Maryland there where he was operating. The heart was very old Osawatomi, and over there, you got uh, Maximilian Robespierre. <laughs> okay. Another one I'd just like to mention, I was talking about him last week here. Uh, probably my favorite revolutionary of all time is the subcomandante Incidente Marcos. All right. This was a norm de guerre used by a Mexican insurgent of the Zapatista army during the Chiapas conflict. Later on, and that like this, they had a presidential campaign, and he identified himself as, I guess you'd say, Delegate Zero. <laughs> 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 That's the most he ever saw, this guy. Um, there are provocateurs, provocateurs operating in the United States today. Certainly these two women would qualify. They're making a lot of noise. I heard she's going to be the next Democratic representative, or the Democratic nominee next year for the Democrats. Well, we'll wait and see on that one. Yeah, yeah Maxine Waters. Now, the other thing is, uh, and, and this played a big part in many revolutions, believe you me, his relationship with the church. And his position was uh, the... Uh, at least according to the people in Sickle that came out, the covering the topic was uh, you got to be careful about, they call them secular socialist executioners. This does, that's not the only thing, not of them, but you don't listen to revolutionaries because there's the permanent ethical standards of the church and that preserves the traditions of an orderly society. Am I just getting listened to now? <laughs> to me, they have me turned down and nothing. I think. But uh, the permanent ethical standards of the church uh, to preserve the order. That's what I mean. That choice is your disorder or listen to the church. And certainly the church was a party in many of these revolutions. We'll see. Uh, most recently, though, Jeff Sessions, uh, reference scriptures and he said there's a clear and wise command of the Apostle Paul in Romans quote to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained them for the purpose of order so there you go you don't want to go about sinning right okay another thing that, that precipitates revolution certainly they've been a principal actor in some of these uh, the organized labor movement do you see here what the Chicago police had to do to restore order when the mob in, in, at Haymarket. Uh, given today, on July 14th, right today, is the anniversary of, listen to this, 
the, the, the Battle of the Viaduct at Austin and 18th Street. This is a strike that spread from 17th State to started out east. It followed the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad to Chicago, ended up at Austin Street there, and the 10,000 rioters were met with baton and pistol, as well they should have been. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, you go join them. <laughs> All right. Another thing that may precipitate, and this is a lot of people discount this, however, is that the ballot box is a method uh, to bring about change. The socialists in Great Britain adhere to this. They're called the Fabian Socialists. You can legislate it. Looking at labor laws, I don't think that's ever going to happen. We're losing labor laws. We're not gaining them. But anyhow, uh, by working for candidates, I certainly would not disavow working for the candidate of your choice. We did see something of a revolution last week in which this young lady, uh, Alexandria is her name, uh, defeated the incumbent uh, in, a, in New York. Okay, now certain modern tactics of revolutions. I uh, will get drama through with this, but uh, the media, they're trying various things. I got these already, a blue wave is coming, it's all over the place. Uh, protests outside the White House, but uh, certain organizations are getting whipped together. Um, but one of the things in any revolution, coming to any revolution, is uh, not only what precipitates it, but the reactionary or retaliation. And that's a big part of any revolution, the reactionaries. What do they do? Do they, do they, do they uh, everybody says, oh, that's okay, do whatever you want, that looks good. Uh, no, that's not what happens. But there is retaliation by established authorities. Uh, dissenters are considered very often dangerous. Uh, trouble, yes, bomb throwers, we identified revolutionaries, destroyers. I, can't, I actually looked up uh, revolutionaries looking up on Google Images, and these are the things that came up. So the, their efforts, there's an effort to portray any revolutionary as rioters, lacking any real, per they're probably right, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you can get a new pair of shoes, why not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they just want nothing better than to turn over your car. Yeah, yeah they'll take yeah. that brand new Forester of yours, they'll tip it over. Yeah, yeah cheer, you know, look at, that's all they need, fire hoses. In, in Europe, yeah. they had a thing, they, not only would they spray the protesters, but they sprayed them with a, a certain color. It was like yellow. Yellow, they had yellow uh, coloring in the water. And if you if they saw anybody walking around a few days later, if you were bright yellow, they arrested you. <laughs> now there's some people that claim, like my friend back there, that gun control will result in totalitarianism and precludes revolutions from taking place. There actually is common terminology among the gun advocates, they use the term second revolution, that they're coming to get your weaponry. And they tell you what to do. They say, you know, guys in the United Nations blue helmets are going to come to your house and get your guns, anybody that owns it. But uh, no, um, gun control, not every, every country that has affected gun control has, has become a totalitarianism. So there's no, as a matter of fact, no country. So that's not necessarily the case. Okay, I also looked up here regarding the troublesome of people is, is that working? Yeah, it's working. Oh, all right. But uh, what is the threat posed? Now this one I found rather interesting. This is the, the official Close security clearance to work in the White House or in the government. It's called a standard form 86. Standard forms are, as opposed to agency forms, forms that are common, common to every agency. And I quite well know 86. I had issues regarding it. 
they issued key cards many years ago to federal employees that you didn't need guard. And then they discovered that thousands of employees did not have security clearances. And they wanted them to do it again. And if you didn't pass it, you were immediately removed from your position with very limited appeal rights. But anyhow, the one you want to get to show that you're not a, a, not a re revolutionary is a Yankee white. But common to any security clearance, and I won't go through all of this, they want to know if you've had any foreign contacts. And the capital words in this are not mine. But have you ever had any financial interest with foreigners? They want to know about your psychological health. They want to know if you're nuts. <laughs> um, they want to know if you, you're an IT guy. You've been breaking in the systems. But the last one is uh, association record. Have you ever been a member of an organization dedicated to the overthrow of the government? Uh, when I joined the government, they gave me a list. I kind of looked it over and I, the guy said, all right, it's good enough. And I, I said, well, I'm not finished. He said, all right. <laughs> and quite technically, I won't get into the issue about why I may or may not have gotten the security clearance. <laughs> Bureaucracies aren't perfect. <laughs> but as I say, they were not, I won't get into that deal. I know what happened there. All right, but anyhow, this is the thing, the White House. Yeah, you're going to tell me those guys that met with the Ruskies passed this? How? Unbelievable. And these are not taken lightly. The average security clearance cost, last I've heard the figures, are $2,300. They're a pain in the ass to process, too. At least they were when I was in the Navy. All right, this is not taken lightly. Anyhow, the other thing is the law. You want to become a revolutionary? Hey, no problem. Just look up the U.S. Code, though. And I won't read all of this, but if you have the intent to cause the overthrow and destruction of the government, if you print, publish, edit, issue, circulate, sell, distribute, or display written material advocating, advertising, or teaching the duty, necessity, desirability, or propriety of overthrowing, or destroying anything of the government, you're going to get in 20 years of jail. Yeah, that's getting off easy, I'd say. All right, another thing a revolutionary has got to think about is the Posse Comitatus Act. Meaning, yeah, you want to start a revolution? Well, you may find yourself confronted with a little larger force than you anticipated. Now granted, some of these things have not implemented in years or decades, but they in fact are on the books, 1871. That's a regarding the use of the federal government uh, to quell disturbances, uh, the use of uh, soldiers. Okay, drifting off in another little thing. Um, uh, this was a very good book. It was made into a documentary, but a force more powerful. It shows how popular movements used nonviolent actions to overthrow dictators, obstruct military invaders, and secure human rights in country after country. They even had some things about the Dutch under the Nazis and things like that. But it's a very interesting collection of stories. I can only highly recommend it. Another thing Tim has spoken on this, but Gene Sharp, he's in the nonviolent community, well known, he researched thousands of nonviolent struggles and grouped them into broad 108 different categories. So it's easy to remember Gene Sharp. And he's got a list of every conceivable thing you could do uh, that might be considered revolutionary, a definitive list. Okay, another thing, not only are you going to have to confront the government, but as I say, reactionary parties are going to be those who've got something to lose. The multinational corporations are going to be right Him. up there up front um, wanting to do it. 
Um, do you need a lighter? I go. No, no, easy. <laughs> I, I, okay, now there's another types of revolutions. I just think, and they are somewhat related. There is a relevance to this. I believe we in the 60s went through a cultural revolution. Um, I'm still recovering from it. Trucks. <laughs> yes, it is groovy. Yeah. And now we got another one. And I can see. I was thinking out it. We've got another one. Is me too. And the women are out there. Certainly, we're confronted with another type of cultural revolution. Uh, it's another thing that you could look at in precipitating revolutions are the values that differ among generations. These millennials, I, they're not ever going to revolt. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to the, these yuppies, they ain't going to happen. They just ain't got it in them. You know, give it up. You know, something didn't work. You know, they shot a blank with those guys. I don't know, but there's different generations. You can pursue this all you want. What? Yeah, I don't know what the color is. I don't understand what the color is. What are the colors? <laughs> I'm not gonna. You're a millennial Gen X. You can look it up. The um. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Here's the. All right. The greatest generation versus um. Uh, the, the current ones. These troublemakers here. They're shutting down all the. What did they do? They shut down every school in the United States. You know what's going on here. You didn't, you didn't see that decades ago. Another thing that's often talked about in revolutions is the industrial revolution. Uh, of course, technology, but we were really not here to discuss that. And uh, actually, the industrial revolution, in fact, did precipitate revolutions. Uh, it certainly did. Whether or not it can be considered a cause, I think it might. You know, it's up, it's up to you guys to decide out there. All right, let's see here. Now we're going to get into, we're done with that. So now you know all about revolutions and what causes them. All right, the tests will be on Tuesday. All right, now we're briefly going to go through the French Revolution, uh, which we are celebrating today. Uh, it just expands over a 10-year period uh, in France. Um, before we get into it, this happened well before the revolution, but here's a story I came across, and there's, oh. actually there's 30 versions of this, and they're all great to read. I love reading these. But it's 1775, a schoolboy who was in fact an orphan, and he got a scholarship to go to the school. He was lucky enough to get chosen among the 500 pupils at the school to read his poem to the king and queen who were coming through town um, on coronation day. Unfortunately, it was raining and they didn't stop as planned. Instead of stopping, they kept on spread through town and they splashed mud on this kid's clothes. <laughs> who do you think that kid was? Robespierre. 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 Oh, it's payback time, girl. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but anyhow, France had been at war. They had four big wars, most notably the Seven Years' War in the United States, known as the French and Indian War. Uh, they were in debt, seriously. And then on top of it, they went in debt to finance the American Revolution. The, the, the assembly that the king had to consult with, and they just consulted with this very rarely. He had not called the assembly, if you wish, to meet since 1614. This is 1789. Was that 140 years? This began in 1300. They had little collaborative bodies of, of nobility, what have you. These, the estates actually comprised three parts. They had the nobility, and the second estate was the clergy, and the third estate were the common folk, the regular guys. Now, the, here's what happened. The, first, the third estate constituted 98, 99% of the people. 
the first two states didn't pay one penny in tax. The church occasionally, I'm getting into detail, the church occasionally, this was amazing, would make a contribution to the government every five years. Not much. But the first two states paid nothing and the third did. Actually, what also caused problems were, now you can see if, if the votes were two to one, but they doubled the size of the third state. So they thought they qualified to get two votes. Makes sense. They used to have 300 members and they, they doubled it to 600. They said, well, why don't we get two votes now? And the kids said, oh, no, that's not the way it works. <laughs> so they weren't happy to do that. Anyhow, during the course of the 10-year period, this organization, if you wish, went through many transformations and was the guiding force of the revolution. It began as the States General, then it became a National Assembly, then it became a National Convention, and later parts of it were Committee of Public Safety, Directory, and ended up as the Consulate. So it had different functions over time. Every emanation with increasing authority. But the, the, the king called this, and this was the beginning of problems um, from the get-go. He tried to shut them down, and it didn't work. They took an oath that they would meet regardless any time, any place, regardless of the views of the monarch. Uh, equal at this period of time, and as I said, there were philosophies behind revolutions with the philosophes. And I remember also reading, <clears throat> as a young man in my room, I had one lamp, this neck lamp reading, the philosophes Montesquieu. I said, wow, this is great stuff. <laughs> but they had their essayists. But the philosophy of the French Revolution, there's a lot of details, so I'll read it for you. But just as scientists had discovered laws that governed the natural world, they said that might these laws also apply to human beings and institutions such as government? Are there laws, natural laws of government? And they began to question how do governments get formed and what principles are used? And they said, what's this crazy divine right of kings? They said, that's nonsensical. No one is chosen, chosen by God. And they use secular reason and logic they answered the important questions, and they had no use for religion or superstition. So you can see this would cause a problem here. Now what the king and queen were called the ancient regime, that's what they refer to now. And Louis the, the 16th and Marie Antoinette. And I also, also added in there, during the course of the revolution, his title changed. When it began, he was the king of France, in the middle of it, he became just the king of the French. And at the end of the revolution, he was just Louis. <laughs> <laughs> now what happened was, and getting a little bit ahead of the time, the king had problems with these estates and with the mobs. We'll get into this shortly. Um, he, I, I guess I'll get ahead of it. He tried to escape. Uh, Paris, and he was captured about 50 miles from the border. But this did him in because at that point he was considered a traitor. He was going over to the side of the Germans. Marie Antoinette was a German. Uh, she's the daughter of Maria Theresa, and her brother was king of Austria. Uh, so, and uh, she was also accused of sending secret war plans and stuff like that to the Germans. But anyhow, the king, up until this time, the, among the, even the kings of Europe, the French kings, Louis XIV, uh, they had the expression, I've heard this for the first time, used in the United States in political science by one of the television commentators regarding the president of the United States. <laughs> Let us say moi, I am the state. This is what the king said. Uh, he was embodiment of the state himself. Uh, now I gotta ask you though, 
Would you really follow a guy who wore big little ribbons instead of shoes? <laughs> I gotta do that. <laughs> big little ribbons, cutie. Uh, by the way, another thing, uh, they, here are the governments in debt, and they're not big, but the lifestyle of the rich and famous. Marie Antoinette, we used, I wasn't gonna put this in there, but they'd amuse themselves with these fanciful hairstyles. You should have like a bird cage in it and ships and things like this. <laughs> Anyhow, what happened was they had to get at the beginning again, clear your mind, they had a crop failures. Uh, several years in a row, there's even some talk that it was the little ice age, but the crop and there was no food. And plus the country was bankrupt. And now the French, of course, eat two pounds of bread a day, but the price of flour became equal to a peasant's monthly earning because there were food shortages. This is serious. This, this is what really was the spark here in this case. Now, the, the troublemakers in this thing, uh, there's all kinds of guys. Uh, you probably heard it. They had different factions, okay, different groups. Just like they in Russia, there were Bolsheviks in this. There were Jacobins. There were Geraldins. There were guys called the High Mountain, because they sat way up in the assembly, way up high. And different things. But my favorite one the, the, and were the Sankulats. And this term is used very commonly. And to distinguish themselves from the mobility who wore those knee braces. And they wore long trousers, more common to working men, pantaloons. And they also wore these red caps. We'll see these again. Uh, that's a freedom cap, pylon. Um, and the little badges that uh, everybody wore those. OK, the Jacobins, by the way, there's no meaning to that. That's just the name of where they would be. They, they met at the convent of the Jacobin nuns or something. They were looking for a church to meet. It'd be like if we met, we would be called the Dappers. So there's no real meaning to these terms. Uh, anyhow, uh, the first thing they did, the mob got fed up with it. And a revolution was, in fact, ensuing. And they got weaponry from armory, but then they needed powder, which was kept in the Bastille. And the mob then went, and there was I have really no prisoners there, but they took the Bastille, and amazingly enough, they were so fent up with energy that they completely demolished it, brick by brick, even though they didn't blow it up. They just wrecked it. Uh, this was one crazy mob. It was just wild. Uh, and then they would cut off heads and, and put the guy's head on a pike march around and have a parade, you know. Uh, the other thing that happened subsequent to this Bastille uh, this episode was that you know, spontaneously the markets and the fish women and so forth who run the markets, all the women of, of, the, of Paris get, got together, thousands of them, something like 5,000, and marched to the palace in Versailles. And they wanted to, they thought the king wasn't aware that they were starving. But this is pent up crowded, and when they got there, they ransacked the, the palace, and they made the king and queen move back to Paris. And they were actually at that point somewhat under like house arrest. The mob had taken over the country. You see, they're growing in all this. Now, while this is going on, the National Assembly is piecing together a constitution. They're looking on various versions, constitutional monarchy, a republic, and what have you. But one of the things they added in that is lasting endurance is the Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen. These are 17 articles. It's from the bedrock of the revolution. And some of these are like men are born free and equal in their rights. Uh, liberty, prosperity, security, and the law is the expression of the general will, not the king. And all citizens have the right to take part personally 
in the making of the law. That's pretty broad. That's pretty bold things. This is this is uh, at the period of time. Okay, the revolution is ensuing. Uh, one of the things I wanted to bring in, you may at one time or another have seen this painting and not fully understood what it was all about. But as we saw earlier, uh, Jean Paul Marat was the publisher of the uh, paper, The People's Friend, Friend of the People, one of the three leaders of the revolution. But someone took it upon him, this girl killed him. He was actually had some skin condition and was taking a medicinal bath. That's why he looks like he's killed in his bathtub. But this was a tragic event. Uh, one of the revolutionaries that everyone mourned passing. Just some information here, some of the illustrations of the time. Look at this, burning the throne. Look at that. Ooh, yes, that is an oligism, I have to ask you. And there you see the sound school lots. You know. Uh, the other thing is, I mentioned that the king tried to escape uh, the country because they had him on house arrest. But some guy stopped him, and there's a couple, I love this. There's always different versions of it. But some guy stopped him, and he, he said, wait a minute, aren't you the king of France? And he says, oh, 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 oh what do you mean? How would I, what are you talking, am I the king? He says, yeah, you're just like the guy on the coin. <laughs> Now the fact that the guy was riding in the biggest carriage in town, you know, my suspicions <laughs> that this was someone other than your regular passenger passing through. But allegedly, and I questioned this, I said, I thought it was baloney. And now that I look at it, I say, yeah, you know, he has kind of distinctive features that need to be recognized. I, I got to move on, of course, ensued. They were fearful of, of reactionary people, anti-revolutionary people. There was, in fact, the guillotine was considered a famous form of execution. Did about 2,630 people in Paris who were counter-revolutionary uh, to the cause of the revolution. Published the schedule each day. The revolution continued on until ultimately there was a coup d'etat by a leader under Napoleon Bonaparte nice put together something called the consulate, and later on he became the first consul. So, but the effects of the, he tried, actually he tried to implement the, the aspects of the revolution. So there was no issue about that. One last thing about the song, Roger de Lisle, the Marseillais, and this is uh, some of the words, the thirst, I love this, their thirst for gold and power and bond, to met and bend the light and air. The, the nobles would actually sell you sunlight and air if they could. <laughs> would they load us like gods would bid their slaves the door? Come on. Anyhow, the last night, tyrants, everyone is a soldier to combat you. If you fall, if they fall, the earth will produce no one. Now that's a warning to tyrants. That's what I say. All right, liberty, yes. Okay. <laughs> this is from our own. You can see the influence. That's on the Capitol building in the United States. All right, I got to move on. Timeline, I really don't want to keep here too long. Timeline, I'm going to move very quickly on this next part. These are significant revolutions. Okay, in ancient Rome, uh, oops, whoops. Okay, not really anything, although there were revolutions in England, France, Judea, Syria, and Germany. They weren't of any particular magnitude. The Romans at any given time at sometimes could put together a lead third day at 30 legions. And they had 53,000 miles of roads that they could dispatch them on. Uh, they were masters at warfare. They, they had short spears called the pilum. And, um, most, more importantly than that, uh, they used something called the short, a short uh, sword called the gladius. And it's been said that the gladius was used to kill more people than any other weapon or any other means 
until they invented a gunpowder. Oh. Yeah. Uh, only in Germany could a revolution, they made a little success, and they agreed upon a border there. Uh, okay, that's the Romans. Uh, the Chinese had various present revolutions. The emperor, of course, had to have the Band-Aid of Heaven. The Band-Aid of Heaven, if, food, if there was no food, apparently the gods were displeased with them. They did have certain peasant uprisings. Uh, fortune cookies originated from the practice of passing messages inside <laughs> hidden. Uh, they did have, some of these are kind of interesting. They, they had a, they said they're revolutionaries. You just had to wear like different pieces of clothing. So they had the red turbans, revolution, and then they had another one, so they had, a, that became the yellow revolution. So if the guy with yellow, he was okay, you know. So that kind of thing. There's also a famous secret phrase. They used the one, I love this, it was, the phrase was, rise up on the 15th of the 8th moon. <laughs> if you're a revolutionary, you knew what that meant. If you weren't, there's something else. Um, the Dutch Revolt, why is this of any importance to anybody? It was the first time a country took got rid of the yoke of colonialism. The Dutch got tired of, of paying Philip II to Spain to engage in warfare. They said enough is enough. It went on from 1568 to 1648. That's what I mean. This took forever to get rid of this guy. Um, actually, they, I like this. They were taken over. They, they were taken over by William of the Orange. And now you wouldn't fit in the College of Complex at all. William the Orange was known as the Silent, and he just liked talking about controversial issues. So he wouldn't fit in here. Anyhow, that's the first uh, uh, fight against colonialism. Uh, one that we don't talk about is but a very significant to anyone from the Isles in the English Civil Wars. Um, actually a series of interlocking conflicts. Their cabs are here about cavaliers, and brown heads. Oliver cried only for a 10-year period during the middle of this was England ever a republic from 1649 to 60. It's the only time in its history it was a republic. Cromwell refused to take the throne. Um, okay, <coughs> let's see. All right, the, the only, all I like this one, this, these are some of the paintings, of course, historical paintings. They're trying to extract a, a young guy, young boy here to turn in his prayer. It's terrible. Look what they're doing. These revolution. Look what revolutionaries will do. What kind of people are they? They want to. They want you to turn in, turn in your father. You know. I ask you now. That's what you got to do with them. You got to get rid of them. You know. Anyhow, the king was the. Well, the first at least. Uh, didn't come to a good end uh, as a result of this conflict. Of course, we know about the American Revolution. Molly Pitcher there, who took the place at the candidate uh, for her husband who had fallen. This allegedly are the people that got us independence <laughs> instead of a standing army, that some people are led to believe. Um, there certainly was a division among the population. Uh, and everyone had to take sides. Uh, one of the first significant things after the Declaration of Independence was signed was that the citizens of New York took down the statue of the king in the park and melted him down into musket balls, something like 46,000. One of the revolution, no, they're moving on. Another revolution, we're sequentially here, but that is very little discussed is that of Toisson Overture and the Haitian Revolution. This was the first island discovered by Columbus there, uh, the Spanish island. It was the richest colony in terms of sugar and coffee production. The French didn't want to lose this. It is the first and only revolt by slaves that was successful. This is worth studying of its own. But it's a the the struggle continued on. Uh, 
the French actually sent a force of 50,000 and the succumbed to money. yellow money. fever and other things like that and gave up on it altogether. That's why Napoleon sold us Louisiana, because he had trouble here in, in Santo Domingo. There's an island both French and Spanish. And the United States, of course, evaded it in the 20th century. The Marines ran it for a period of 19 years. Very interesting story. In terms of Latin America, and I'm talking about um, basically within two decades, the whole subcontinent, we had gotten rid of uh, the Spanish rule. Um, the, uh, the Napoleon got rid of the Spanish emperor, and they didn't want to, they didn't, they said, well, this other guy is a phony emperor. We're not going to pay homage to him. So, um, the, uh, and the two principal figures, of course, in any discussion of this, we're talking about Central and South America. Actually, I, a lot of people don't know this. It was, a, it was a South and Southern Mexico. It's a country, a province called Central America, which later became five countries. There was also a country called Greater Colombia. But of course, uh, Simon Bolivar and the other guy who was in Brazil uh, was Jose Francisco de San Martin, who, who uh, uh, got gained the independence. But if you want, Brazil's kind of funny. They had the king and then they they went back, so it's kind of... Uh, well, that was Argentina, rather. All right, now the revolution of nope. This was the only time the colonial powers ever lost a real big battle, was in fighting the Zulu. Zulu nation, if you want empire, put tribes together. But the British lost uh, at the battle of Islas Juana, two leaders of the Zulu, Shaka Zulu and Chetswea. Uh, British had a man lost about 2,000 troops. It was the only, actually, these guys, they invented, they talk about new arm. they won because they had new methods of spears and shields and stuff. So it was kind of thing. The idea of the revolution continued on. In 1848, there was a series of revolutions across at least five countries in Europe. These are largely in urban areas. For those of you that think revolutions are only among the peasants seeking land, these were urban revolutions. They really didn't overturn anything. Uh, but there were troubles and dissatisfactions, barricades, <coughs> perhaps where it's noted most noted feature. Um, but these are urban middle class things. Another bit of revolutions we don't think of were the Indians Plain Wars, big going up until 1890. Uh, they were forced to give up all of their lands to about six percent of what they originally had. Okay, other things that came along later in the century were the Boxer Rebellions to throw out the foreigners. Again, foreign occupation, uh, the boxers, because they were called the Society of Righteous Harmony, or, ri or Righteous Fist. They, they were both opposed to their own monarchy as well as the foreigners. But later on, principally, to get rid of the foreigners. Okay, didn't know when they had it, good. Okay, another war will, is the War of Northern Aggression, of course. When the, you had a president who was opposed to a constitutional, decentralized type of government. I don't know why. And here's the one I came across. If you look at this, the comrades. Oh, I don't think be you. Comrades. Any comrades. Now the one, the Mexican Revolution. The Mexicans got rid of the Spanish, 1821-23. You all should know about this, Diaz. Uh, Emiliano Zapata, uh, Pancho Villa, uh, they celebrate the Hilalo, uh, uh, Father Delgado, uh, uh, precipitated the independent movement. Uh, actually, there's a lot of presence of women in this who wearing a beret. Uh, I'm not Spanish, speak to Soladeras. Okay. Another one, the Russian Revolution, you're all pretty familiar with. 
uh, the Bolsheviks. Uh, you had Comrade Lenin there, yeah. uh, yeah. speaking to the crowd in St. Petersburg. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now the Communist Revolution, not only did they, do it, they weren't happy with taking over Russia, no. You couldn't let that happen. These guys wanted, they, <coughs> communism wasn't contained in the Soviet Union. Yeah, Marx told them it got to be spread worldwide, all over the world. So then you see there, Wait, look what they did, look what they were taking over the world. That this is a threat if I had copies. And now they're still at it. Oh, yeah. Can you go back to the last slide? Looks like a white ring of course. Wow, that's amazing. Spain too, of course. Yeah. Well, okay, Charlie. All right, we got a react Chinese Revolution, of course. Okay, show Putin again. So no, we've seen enough of this guy. Yeah, we're gonna see him in prison. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, the Cultural Revolution. This is a good idea. If you got people up big, put them on trial. Put them out there. We can, yeah, gather in the park, you know, say, hey, look at this schmuck. You know, that's a good idea. Stay home, read, read some good books, like I said, you know. Find some good communist literature, like this family. They're, they're enjoying it, mother and father. <laughs> The son brought home some things. Um, there's the dear leader talking with the people. They seem happy. There's, there's, there's no issues there. By the way, this, talk about decades. The, the, the thing that, that this is a, there's, there's, if you ever get a chance, read about the long march and the decades that they weren't pursuing this. This one on, this revolution took forever. The other one that's of significance, the Spanish Civil War, we had veterans of it speak here at the college. Uh, Franco and the Flanges. Flanges is phalanx, or an army unit. Uh, the Republic came in and they didn't like it. I threw in a little thing here about my own homeland here, the Lithuanian Freedom Fighters, the Forest Brothers. And uh, you don't have to get into this unit, range and size. And they, uh, and um, they lived uh, in the forest, and they were fighting for decades uh, against the occupation of Lithuania using carefully hidden weapons. And when the Lithuania finally gained its independence, they used the name of the movement of the, of the Soros Brothers, the Soyutas. Uh, and the Soviet military responded harshly. But the courage of its citizens, linking arms and singing, Singing, they called this a singing revolution, showed that the Lithuanian citizens were prepared to defend their national. They sang songs. Guy said, Thanks for saying my song. You know, they'll show you, we're not afraid. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, here's the list. We're almost done. A uh, list of all the revolutions we're not going to get into Algeria, Cambodia, Iran, the Shining Path, El Camino Luminoso, the Sandinistas. Tiananmen Square, Balkans and the Arab Spring. And there uh, you, you can see the reactionary forces to reserve some of these. Uh, we had them speak here. This revolutionary effort in, in Syria right now. To create, to, to have a democratic experiment on the caliphate. Uh, they came here and spoke. Now this is rather interesting. They have women's units because ISIS fears that if you're killed by a female, kills them in battle, it will be a disgrace and dishonor and will prohibit them from men with That's true. There have been, in fact, peaceful resolutions. Certainly the Gandhiji, the, Gandhi, the Gandhiji uh, in South Africa and the Soviet Union. The United States, of course, we had it on this. We generally, yeah, there you go, capitalism succeeds. Tell that to these people. Yeah, yeah. yeah these people looking for their money. Yeah, capitalism, oh yeah. yeah. All right, last part is the UN. It's the nation of Christ. Yeah. Are we near revolt? Are we near revolt, citizens? Yes. What happened to the rule of law? 
Can we kick this guy out? Anyhow, I like this. Trump declared. That's what I mean. History is wonderful. When I watch this, I go, there's this stuff again. It's all comes back again, repeats itself. He says, I can pardon myself. He's having lawyers look this up, you know. Let us say, moi. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> Anyhow, and then he comes along with a Supreme Court nominee who says he can't be indicted, sued, or even investigated. What kind of federal employee is this? He's got total immunity because he would be distracted. This guy would be distracted. Pardon himself. And then, oh, I love this one. Revolutionary activities can take many forms, like seeing the Trump staff they were anonymous before his inauguration had suddenly become the focus of planned and sometimes spontaneous public fury. Uh, <laughs> calling him a son of a bitch, you know. Get out of here, I throw him out of the coffee shop. Anyhow, the president is basically a recluse. Okay, in the end, yeah, all right, sit, sit down. <laughs> Italians, <laughs> Marshall. Thank you. Oh, shut up. All right. Yay. Yay. Can you can you self moderate, Charlie? <laughs> No, that's not exactly the right song. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll do my own moderating. All right. Subcommandante can handle that. All right, Charlie, I'd like you to, uh, what do you think of what we happened in the early 1990s called the capitalist revolution that spread around the world? in lieu of communism and your and your particularly your takes on globalization uh, well you, wait a minute you, you you're talking about the bolsheviks in in russia no i'm talking about that's what happened in 1990 i'm talking about perestroika like like what right happened when in 1989 the windows went up Socialism and the walls and came tumbling down. Oh. Of, I'm not aware that anybody burned all the volumes of, regarding socialism that had implemented, all the aspects of socialism that had been implemented around the world. We're talking about they got rid of the Bolsheviks in one country. I, I don't think you I, who A lot of people, even including the chief of the communists that was here, that there was not the end of communism. I know. Where, didn't you see that map? Yes, I did see think, that map. Do you think that any of those concepts were inculcated by the people who lived in those countries? I do think, you think that... Matter of fact, and I, in response to your thing, okay. going back to that, in, the, in Lithuania we talked about, <laughs> oh, they celebrated, we got rid of the communists. But the election came through, and then the next one, and the one after that, they elected a communist. <laughs> because the people discovered that there were aspects of communism or socialism that they were not ready to get rid of. And some Lithuanians were totally upset that they brought in if you wish, the communists back. I told you there's reactionary movements. And they thought this was completely and totally reactionary. But here's the thing. We witnessed this ourselves, Timmy. Uh, get rid of Obamacare. Get rid of Obamacare. Get rid of Obamacare. Get rid of Obamacare. What are you going to replace it with? That's right. Do you have a health care alternative? Is it preferable? Is it better? Is it cheaper? Is it more coverage? Is it this or that? A thousand questions, but you offer nothing other than to say, well, we're going to get rid of X, but we have no Y. So, uh, no, they, I, I don't think capitalism is. Do, do, you think, do you think the people even in Russia want what's going on now? That's ridiculous, that oligarchy. It's mercantilism, Charlie. Merc it's called theft. There's someone in charge. It's <laughs> called theft. 
<laughs> All right. Mercantilism. <laughs> Why? Okay, let's move on. All right. Big John. <coughs> He's behind you. You're next. Thank you for your talk, Charlie. Um, one of the reasons why I think so many of us love coming back to the College of Complexes and hearing you speak is your knowledge enables you to play either side of a debate because you can play the pro or the con. <laughs> oh, are you being, are you accusing me of, that's a personal attack. <laughs> He's saying I'm disingenuous. Yeah. yeah, out of order. Point of order. Yes. If we are indeed in a new type of struggle in the 21st century, uh, if you will, a information war, a war of information and uh, data, uh, could you say either in uh, whether you personally feel this way or just arguing for the affirmative, uh, we're in an age where transparency and uh, full disclosure are as important as ever because it, it, it's about a well-informed citizenry. So how would you see uh, and what people would you see right now be the true revolutionaries <coughs> of a war of information to keep the public informed? And I'm, of course, thinking about people like Edward Snowden. Uh, I, I, regarding young ex-librarian, and they people don't realize this. There's a very there all information. I don't know if this answers your question. There's a hierarchy in validity and standards to information, and depending on the source, and <laughs> reputable sources such as the New York Times, the Post. Uh, some of the weeklies that used to be Time Magazine, the verified information, Pravda. you know, uh, major publications. And there's even some theories about information technology that anything that's really important is going to be in those publications. And the rest of it is peripheral. Uh, it's just like in any discipline or subject, there's one magazine that covers the essential aspects of that body of knowledge. And that's the one you look to. And regarding information, that's where you've got to go. Self-discipline so and use. And that's what libraries do. When they have limited budgets, and what, what do I stock in my library, is you always get the recommended and, and generally agreed upon sources of people that put out reliable information. And those sources are, you know, you find them in your basic libraries. You know, now you've got nonsense out there, of course, on Facebook, you know. And anybody can publish anything. That's gibberish, like for children. All right, Big Mike, what do you got? Okay, this is so I'm sorry. We got the young lady here. You, I skunked you. Why did Occupy Wall Street uh, fail to make an impact, fail to make a difference? Did they, um, what could they have, could they have done something to be more effective? Um, why? No, no, no. Well, I'm not certain uh, what the goal well, is. Um, I've seen many of these come and go as an activist over the years. Uh, certainly was a popular uprising of sorts which spread to many, many places. Some aspects of it, I think they got, and to be honest with you, I don't know what these encampments were. And I saw them in Boston and other cities. And I was involved in the city. We were insisting on maintaining these. And uh, to be honest with you, there's some of the focus was on these encampments when I said these things are like immaterial and I, I don't think that's the emphasis whereas like one guy in particular said this is crucial to have these. I don't know why I, I they set their priorities but um, they have done I don't know that would have made them actually make an impact I don't know how do you define uh, this group or what their goals were 
There was so, no so collective. Is that they didn't define what their goals were. Is what? That, yeah, thank you. Is your do you maintain then that Occupy Wall Street just didn't mean have goals? Have I don't know what they were precisely. <laughs> Okay. See, that's what I mean. In the French Revolution, that assembly went on to define itself. And they met and worked on it, and then issued a declaration of principles that everybody could look at and read and discuss and debate. And I'm not, there's nothing codified by Occupy as to what their aims were. So they needed a constitution I mean, and a mission statement. I mean, basically. There's nothing averse to saying the existing order shouldn't be questioned or challenged. I believe they were looking at the disparity. The 99% the disparity, if anything, you focused on the disparity between the rich and the poor. But as I indicated, in something that that's probably one of the most difficult achievements of any revolution. They're, they're not going to, there's not going to be a trade-off involved. Not easily, at least. Yes. L last week, the Honduran speaker said that the uh, United States was uh, causing revolution in Honduras. Do you think the United States is causing revolutions in Central America and Mexico? Sure. Yes. Yeah, why not? <laughs> sure, they've got a principal interest in, in, I actually discussed this, seriously, I discussed this with somebody. They are, there's the body of, well, you're going to hear from it, the CIA is responsible, and there's some that maintain the CIA is responsible, in fact, for every little thing, every sort of insurrection, in the world going back years. There's people that ascribe to this. Now, I, I maintain, I don't know what it is precisely. How do you enter a country and start a revolution? Can you, in fact, do this? I don't know. Nevertheless, there is a body, and they are legitimate, that, yes, the CIA is up to all sorts of activities. And now, here's the thing you have to realize. Interference in the foreign affairs of the, not the interference in the internal affairs of another nation is a declaration of war. It's suitable for a declaration of war. So anything you do on this, but yeah, certainly they take an interest in in what revolutions take place. You darn tootin' they do. And probably why shouldn't they? I don't know how active you want to be. That could, that's, that's a matter of policy. But yes, most assuredly, change in leadership can, can be, mean quite a bit. I mean, you get a guy like me in charge, you got nothing to worry about. <laughs> yeah, sure, Charlie. Okay. All right, Mike. So most of these revolutions seem like they're economic, uh, ec economics is the reason. Uh, power and economics. No, no, human rights. Uh, human rights, right? Yeah. It's not economic. Okay, I got to basic human dignity. If you're a slave, yeah. All right. I mean, I, wait a minute. As a matter of fact, you're a little bit wrong, I, and I will, I will, I will refute that. The argument was, and long I've long maintained this. The reason George Washington wanted to head up the American army is because George Washington, earlier in life, had wanted to be in the British Army. <laughs> he even ran the best militia unit in the colonies, the Virginia Blues. They were the best unit. And the British told him he even was a hero in the French and Indian War. He had won a battle. He had distinguished himself in battle. He'd gotten his coat like shot four times. And they said, unfortunately, you don't have the proper heritage. <laughs> God. And I'm going to tell you, he was a payback time. Because they told him to get lost. And yeah, for him, that revolution was, I'll show you, you son. <laughs> the father of our country? Said yes. That? Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for you. You're darn right. Well, why wouldn't he? <laughs> he did everything possible to qualify, and then he didn't. How do you think that makes his portrait, his portrait, 
was in a military uniform. You know, he, he was a soldier. He wanted to be a soldier. And at that time, there was the British Army and there was no army. That's the choice. Okay, here's my question, though. You find uh, that hard to believe? Right no, I believe it. You've had no disappointments in life? Uh, Hurry up, Bill. <laughs> Come on. There's a lot of countries. Is Europe and other countries better? Is it better living you in You asked Europe? me this said earlier. Other, so America no, is America's the most wonderful place on earth. So we are. Yes, sit down. Get out of here. We're a second world. Get country. out of here. Third world. It's wonderful for everyone. All right. You didn't see anything. You didn't Next serve. question, please. Third rich people. No, I got some. Last question. What's wrong right with you? Last question. Me and Dad, you must be praying. Other countries are better. Last question. America's the best country. Okay. Last question. Get out of here. All right. Last question. Get rid of that idiot. Throw him out. All right. All right, Mr. Doug. Um, do you think that the French Revolution would have occurred without the so-called American Revolution? Uh, oh, sure. The French Revolution was first, wasn't it? It wasn't a first? They were in debt. They had four wars in addition to the American Revolution that century. And they had lost the colonies, so they were not bringing in money. Well, I have a follow-up, very quick. Um, there was something called the Candlelight uh, Revolution in um, South Korea, where massive protests led to the president having to uh, be removed from office in a special election and a new president. Do you think something like that could inspire um, that kind of a nonviolent revolution? No. Sorry, guys. Never Probably not. I tell, no, I, I don't, I, you know, for uh, every example, there's a common example. And you're telling, is your assertion that because some, there was a change in leadership that was nonviolent, that it can be done? Thank yeah. you. Do you know how many leaders have resigned in the history of the world? <laughs> You think there's never been a leader, Doug, who resigned? Nixon. <laughs> right in his own country. We had a guy who resigned. They resigned. All right, move on. Give our speaker a hand. All right, yay. Apparently a big hand with all rebuttals now. We can sit down and rebut everybody else. Sorry, guys, I'll be Okay, let's have a show of hands. Who wants to give a rebuttal? And keep your hands up because we don't have five people coming up here at the last minute. It happens every time. Okay. One, two, three, four. Keep your hands up, people. We only got four rebuttals tonight. That's it. Four people. No, we got more. Okay, we'll go eight. Okay, four minutes or less. Looks like three minutes or less. It's it. Yeah, we're, we're all less. Over time. All right, these got to be really short rebuttals. Charlie blew through our time. He gave us an excellent yeah. presentation. Yeah. Okay, like now it, normally it's about the rebuttal. We got time. We got half an hour. Yeah, How many minutes? More than that. How many minutes? Three or four? Three or less. Go three. Okay. We'll probably have ten people. Okay, you get it. I've always been told this is the greatest country in the world, so I'm in shock. Yeah, go get a flag. So, get my flag. why are other countries better than America? And is America due for a revolution? I'll buy you a flag. Charlie, why, why are we being told that we're God the greatest? Bless America. Charlie, let him speak. Why are we being told we're the greatest country in the world? Who does that? I don't know. It sounds like American media and everybody's always told me that. So I guess we aren't. You know? So I don't know if we're on the verge of a revolution or not. The question is, is America the greatest country? Yeah, our living standards, our economies, our... I know we have a good military and we bring a lot of oil here. It's perfect. It's but, perfect. Uh, you know, we're in heaven. Maybe you guys can enlighten me why we're, in heaven. we're not that good of a country. July 4th, 
we had a Declaration of Independence. And America discovered it can get along on its own, and England discovered it can get along on its own. And we can live along peacefully. But we have a new declaration, a Declaration of Interdependence. We all have to get along together. And that's just with each other. It's with the natural world. Right now, I don't know if you've heard about it today, uh, there's a, there's a, 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 a country in uh, a village in Gint, uh, Greenland that is being threatened because one of the glaciers is going to fall off into the ocean and threatens to uh, uh, flood the, the country. Uh, anyway, we're going to have to get along together. One way or the other, we're going to have to do it. I don't know how we're going to do it, and it's very possible by the end of the century we may, we may not be around. So we need a declaration of interdependence. We're all in this together. Thank you, Charlie, for a great talk. Uh, Tom Payne once uh, wrote in a letter, it's time that the president retire, for he has played off so much prudent hypocrisy that other nations, their governments, no longer believe anything he says. So uh, it's time that the oligarchs and the plutocrats and the imperialists and the militarists who are with wealth and power and influence in this country right now uh, end their reign by our action, we the people, so that their hypocrisy doesn't destroy what credibility and legitimacy we have, then uh, we have to arm ourselves. We're in an information age, so what kind of ammunition are you arming yourself with? Do you read every day non-corporate sources? Do you go to the library at least once a week or once a month? You go to a bookstore once a week or once a month. You gather with other people at freedom of speech forums and have free exchange of information and free exchange of ideas. That's how you arm yourself with the information and the greatest weapon that's ever is, existed on earth, our minds. And our voices are just amplifying our minds. So if you're in a room of people who believe in peace, love, democracy, equality, transparency, justice, and respect for Mother Earth are the top priorities of a human being and not getting richer, and not getting more famous, and not letting your ego make deals so you can put your name on front of another hotel somewhere in the world, you don't need to say anything. The whole room could literally be silent and people would know what your stance is. So in this information age, I just once again like to thank Edward Snowden. That's a true revolutionary. He didn't have to fire one bullet, did he? He told the people what we have the right to know. That is far more dangerous than any new science fiction Hollywood big blockbuster movie weapon that you could have. That was two minutes and 20 seconds, so I got a little bit more time. If we are the only ones who hear it, then that's the sound dreams exist. Our ears are as powerful as ocean. If it's there, we'll find it. Every time there's light to catch, going where there's no silence. Pitch me so I'm no part of this. The music's waking up. The tunes are waking up. Music's waking us from the wasted ones. Music's saving us. Tunes are saving us. Music saved us from the United States. The music raised us, the tunes raised us. When the 80s erupted Reagan's wars, hate, fear, drug smuggling, Goliath and sons. Cascading like melting sun, harder than our wildest punch, farther than our farthest run. So if we're the only ones, how was it then that we all are born of a little grain of stardust? We know from love address celebration, we know from just the lullaby memory fading, past the days way far gone, we're not the only ones. We the people evolution is billions waking up. And I want to present that to you, Charlie, as a thank you thank for tonight you. on Happy the Steel Day. And I have a, a little little extra thank you for you from everyone here at the couch.
It's not a revolution if you can't dance to it. And uh, it's not a revolution if you don't have a little good food and good wine and good entertainment. So, One of the uh, most famous love story films recently in the last 20 years, a French film by the name of Amélie. <coughs> We'd like to present you with that DVD film of Amelie. All right. We'd like to present you with some uh, apple yeah. cranberry herbal tea from that well-known French town as Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> We'd like to present you with some crackers uh, from South Carolina. All right. No punchline necessary. Okay. Um, <laughs> Got some French cheese to go with the crackers. Oh, this is really made in France, so please, everybody. Vive la France. Let's hear it for French cheese. Vive la France. It's not tea cheese. Got some strawberries from California to go with. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finally, the booze. And oh my God. An actual <laughs> bottle of really cheap French wine. You don't need to thank us for this. this oh. is, they like gave it to us free when we bought all that. Oh. <laughs> all right. And here's a bag to keep it all. In. Oh, thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Going next. Happy birthday. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 When I look at real revolutions, I think the one thing that caused the Roman Empire to fall was something called return energy on investment. <laughs> the Romans basically had slave power and they couldn't adapt. We had something called the Industrial Revolution, which is all based on a carbon and making it our slave meaning that when people would, slavery finally ended when we made carbon our slave. People started to treat each other better when the introduction of electricity came in. We started treating each other better once we had power, light, and many of the other benefits that energy provides. So it wasn't really, I think the most revolutionary change that's happened in the last 400 years was not only the application of capitalism, but the return on energy investment that each of us needs to do to stay alive. We're much better today because we made carbon our slave. When we start talking about nuclear power, which is about 1,000 times more powerful, particularly in, in the thorium thing, just imagine when we have a when we can get something like that back into us. Imagine what's going to happen when we could make the proper application of nuclear power our slave, particularly thorium. If we could do this, just imagine how the world would become much better off and much more kinder to each other when we have a much better source of abundant energy. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I had to. We had to. <laughs> Go easy, Sid. Go all righty, all right, Sid. The conditions for revolution in the United States are not actually here. Even though you have a population, they say about 140 million people, it's almost half, live in poverty or on the very edge of deep poverty. And usually what happens about every 10 years or so, we have a turn down in the economy. It hasn't happened yet, but the turn down this time will be very, very deep. And will make the 29, 1929 depression look like a tea party because so many people don't have money to live and pay their rent and everything keeps going up and eventually it's going to hit 
the depression will hit, I'd say between now and maybe five years from now at the most. So the conditions would be ripe at that time for a revolution. And if you somebody brought out about the uh, Wall Street, about the 1%, why didn't they succeed? And I think they didn't succeed because there was no unity amongst them. They didn't want to form a party or have some sort of vehicle for changing what's going on. And without a strong vehicle for doing that, you can't have no progress. It's got to be united. People have to be conscious of what is really happening to them, that we got a very, very small ruling class. <laughs> and this ruling class is getting richer and richer, and the majority of people are getting poorer and poorer. Now they tell us that about four and a half percent or something like that is unemployed. But they're not telling you about people that are not being counted as being unemployed. And they're not telling you how these people live that don't have no jobs. <coughs> and so the conditions are far worse than any depression or recession we've had since 1929. So when it'll hit, it'll be very, very deep, very deep. And for that, you have to have consciousness on the part of the people that want to carry out this uh, qualitative change. And we don't have that in the United States. Most people that you talk to don't have no idea of what is really happening, especially if they're living fairly good. And if they're living fairly good, they don't pay much attention to it. And if they do pay attention, they only look at themselves and say things are fine, we'll get out of this, and so forth and so on. Revolutions happen very infrequently in hundreds of years to build up towards it. And we're going in that direction. The United States at one time allowed the working class to have a semblance of progress. It was able to do this because of imperialism, going out in the world and exploiting other people and letting the working class in the United States have a, de a degree of security and a degree of progress. But that is all stopped now. That's gone. So which way are we going to move? And it'll take a lot of uh, organizing before you have a revolution or any kind of qualitative change. And without that organizing, it's not enough to have these uh, ad hoc demonstrations. But the ad hoc demonstrations are building up, and I think we're going to have organizations that will develop. If there's a need, it develops. If there's no need, it doesn't develop. All right. maintain that the United States ha has been the greatest country in the world and can be again. Um, I'm now a mindless follower of Donald Trump as some people have equipped, some people here are. Uh, I do say the following, that for most people who think that the United States is not the greatest country in the world, and there are many ways that it could be improved, ask yourself what would happen if you got busted for a, for a crime in, say, Great Britain or France, you would discover real fast that their system is not quite as staunchly weighted in favor of individual rights as is the case in the United States. Plain and simple. And one thing that I discovered very recently that's very interesting, 
Canada is a country that is basically about as free as our own is, at least traditionally was. Yet, in the 1970s, when Canadian teenagers watched Life Kojak on television in Canada, they were surprised to discover that the police informed the people that they arrested of what their rights were, which they had to do under the Miranda decision. In Canada at that time, there was no such requirement. And as a result, they got a little confused when they weren't accustomed to being informed of what their rights were when they were arrested by the Canadian police. Now, the laws that I've gathered since has been changed in Canada, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the other local police forces in Canada, they're now required to, to inform suspects of their rights as they are here. Forty years ago, that wasn't true. And so, for all its faults, the United States at least has been the greatest country in the world. And yes, it can be again. And we can start doing that by electing as many Democrats to Congress as possible next fall. Thank you. <laughs> all right, next. Next. Go, go. Her. Karina, you got one in here. I know that. All right. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I was going to learn something about the French Revolution, and I learned more than that. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm still short on the history of French Revolution. I thought Charlie was going to put it straight once and for all. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy. I don't know whether he deserves all those gifts. Oh, he does. <laughs> he does. You know, well, uh, somebody brought the question of how come Wall Street movement didn't succeed? How come the 60s didn't succeed? Perfect society? And one of the things that you have to keep in mind, or we have to keep in mind, is that the reason for this country to have a real change, a big one, and this is the critical point, you might disagree with it, we, might, we will have to lose the middle class. Why? Rich people only? And it seems like um, it's being chipped away, but it's not entirely lost. <coughs> but there is real danger that if we lose the middle class, which is the buffer that holds us together, we will end up where most of those revolutions that Charlie explained will be like 80 or 90 percent down below and 10 percent, 15 percent above. And that's a really a scenery of disaster. And it is quite common in a lot of parts of the world. One of them is really Latin America. Even though people like Charlie doesn't believe that there is such a political force as oligarchy. And Somebody here brought a question that, uh, is the CIA really making all the revolutions in Latin America? No. The CIA squashes the revolutions in Latin America and brings on the status quo over and over and over. There were many revolutions in South America, Latin America. <clears throat> That, are, that happened, and they're gonna be happening in the future. Because that in a big inequality persists. The big question is, whenever a revolution like in recently, Salvador and Guatemala, why did they happen? And how come exterior powers 
try to keep the status quo. What is there for them to keep the status quo? And, that's, and, and that usually happens over and over. <coughs> Anyone in here has got the answer? I don't know whether you have come across some quotations like uh, the most dangerous diplomat in Latin America is the U.S. ambassador. <laughs> I hate to admit that. That's it. That's it? Yeah. Oh, no. I haven't even scratched the surface. Write it down. Negro Give him another three dollars and another no. minute. Three dollars a minute. No. Hang on, he's got a question back here. It's a good There's question. No question. No, about the rates. Huh? Can I ask you a question? Oh, you asking me? Yeah, can I ask you a question about the rates? Oh, about the I'll ask you later. Miranda. Dave Zucker mentioned the Miranda rights. That's the wrong guy. Oh, Miranda rights. Miranda rights, you're saying? Yes. Miranda rights. Right. Okay, yeah. Ellen is up next. Yeah, no crosstalk. No questions. No, you can't cross okay, your Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Ellen. Um, I just want to mention that although it's not a revolution, um, with the changing, you know, we're going to be getting the Supreme Court um, uh, justice um, member, and um, you know, so um, Trump has nominated this uh, Brett Kavanaugh. I just actually moved away from that screen. And you know, while this isn't a revolution, um, this is really something which is going to, you know, he's probably going to be confirmed, and it's probably going to change our country for one generation or maybe more. And this is very serious. Um, I feel like um, Roe versus Wade is in extreme jeopardy. Um, I mean, I think there are already six or seven states in the U.S. where there's only one abortion clinic in the whole entire state. So, I mean, it's, it's semi moving toward being abolished already. Now, I read that uh, once Roe versus Wade is overturned, I think about. 21, 22 states are automatically going to overturn it, um, not going to um, abolish um, abortion in those states. And then there is like um, maybe another 20, 21 that are going to keep it. And then there's these um, states in the middle, which right now they even considered Illinois, because I believe that Illinois has a law on their books that if Roe versus Wade is overturned, um, that it automatically becomes illegal in Illinois. However, you know, given our Democratic, uh, no, I, I think there really is a law like that. Um, and however, given our Democratic government, it, I mean, it's hard to believe that that'll stand. But, you know, I really feel like it, it'll be very um, kind of an evil thing um, for that to occur. And the other thing is I, I can only suspect that, you know, Healthcare rights are going to be further demolished. I mean, Trump with the with the Congress and Trump getting rid of the individual mandate, the Affordable Health Care Act is is just going to come falling down over I, I'd say the next five years. It's, it's um, and with the Supreme Court um, justice, it's it's only going to make matters worse. Um, and and then there's a whole myriad of different issues um, which can be affected as well. So I don't know what we can do. Maybe we can try to lobby um, Susan Collins. Maybe we can try to um, lobby um, Murkowski in Alaska. But um, I wish it could somehow be held off um, until after the November elections. But I don't think it's, we're going to be able to do that. So unfortunately, um, just do what you can. OK, thanks. All right. Perfect. Any other rebutters? Am I the last rebutter? This will be quick. Jim Mars wrote in his book, The 
trillion dollar conspiracy about you know the rich people running things. He said, for the, the general population, there's three ways to remove a criminal or a king or an official from office. First, there's a soapbox. Next, there's the ballot box. And finally, there's the ammo box. <laughs> Soapbox, ballot box, ammo box. And uh, the French reached that point. They didn't have a lot of ammo, so they just used guillotines. Guillotine. They said, these people aren't going to prison or anything else. OK, imagine, imagine you're the owner of a company. You're the owner of a fairly large company. Just imagine this for a minute. And you've got your highest paid manager in that company, and you find out He's been raping one employee woman per week for the last few years. As the owner of the company that pays his salary, do you have any responsibility to do anything about that man? Or do you just let him go on raping people as long women as long as he's a good manager and he makes money for you? It depends on the profitability of the manager. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I would say if you like Donald Trump, you have to love the pedophile priest <laughs> because you're in the same moral, legal, and ethical category as the people stood back and say, I don't want to know what those priests are doing. What The information you're giving us, that can't be true, so I'm not going to look at it. Our country is divided between people that live in a bubble and are not familiar with the reality on certain things and people that are outside that bubble created by the news and they've looked at the evidence. I've talked about this a lot. Uh, since uh, Charlie designated the, uh, uh, you know, uh, they talked about the website Common Dreams as being a bunch of lefties. That's the farthest thing from the truth you can have. Common Dreams and Truth Out the Smirking Chimp, those three have Pulitzer Prize winning authors publishing articles daily about what's happened in our country, where we are. Orwell said, right? Who controls the present controls the past, and who controls the past controls the future. If you can have control of the media, you can control the perceptions of people. So we have people believe, Charlie apparently has never heard of Christina Borgesson. She, she was a highly paid, uh, highly respected investigative reporter for Channel 7 News. She got fired and blackballed for trying to report on the the reality of Flight 800, the TWA's flight that crashed in, in the ocean off of uh, east of New Jersey. It was shot down by a dummy missile. The Navy was out there on a training program. That flight didn't explode on its own, and then all those ships scattered and they covered it up. Well, she got the idea, maybe this has happened to other people. So she put together a book. She collected the stories of 18 Pulitzer Prize winning good investigative journalists. The one thing those people had in common is sometime, not all on the same day, mind you, but they all got fired and blackballed and their career was over in the media for trying to report something that was happening in America. That, that was, and Censor News, Project Censor, comes out every year with a book that comes out in October that gives you the top 25 censored, blacked out stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. And the media, of course, runs a blackout on Project Censored. So and Charlie's never read a book on Project Censored, so he doesn't know that the media... I bought the very first edition of that did. damn book. How do you and I've never bought one since. How do you stand up here and say there's no control? I swear media? that's absolutely true. I went to San Myers and Dearborn and bought the first edition and never bothered after that. Why not? Because I didn't see any value the first one. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie, for making my point. What? Uh, yeah. Good job, there are, Charlie. There are, Charlie is a, a great example. There have been others on, on particular subjects. People have the ability to stand in a blizzard of evidence claiming they can't see a single snowflake. Stand in a blizzard, can't see a snowflake. At what point do you come outside the bubble and stop saying, look at me, on this subject I'm dumber than a fifth grader. But on other things, I'm college educated. I got a virtual PhD on this subject or that subject, but on that subject, I'm dumber than a fifth grader, and I'm proud of it. And that's how our billionaire killers are getting away. They say the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, all these appointees that uh, Trump has appointed, they're not out there killing the individual people with handguns. They're passing bills. 
that will let thousands of people die. Get rid of the program of Meals on Wheels. Just let those elderly people starve if they can't make their own food. Cut the budget for, just get rid of the inspectors that inspect toxic pipes dumping chemicals into the rivers and everything. Who cares if a whole bunch of kids downstream get lead poisoning and everything else? Look at what happened in Flint, Michigan. Now, the, the, uh, you know, there's all, all kinds of kids are going to be dying earlier uh, and adults too because of the massive chemical pollution from their water. Now that, that's a billionaire killer. They're not killing with knives or guns. They're using a pen. They're in office. Collectively, we pay their salaries. We are, they're, you know, they're employed supposedly by us. So collectively, we have the responsibility to do something. If we sit back and not do it, anything, we don't vote these people out of office in enough numbers. And we're just like the owner of a company who says, my manager is a good manager, so I'm not going to pay any attention when he raves one woman. We just won't, we'll pretend that's not going on. And that's where we are. So, uh, what's your time? That's up. My time is up now, so Charlie is on the last rebutter. And Charlie is up. Oh, you, oh, you, you got one? Okay, come on up. Hi. Um, before I say something about the lecture, I feel obligated to rebut one of the roboters. Uh, this is the first I've heard that uh, Flight 800 was shot down by the United States Navy. Uh, I just find it uh, impossible to believe that the whole crew of any Navy vessel is going to conspire to keep something like that secret. It's an accident. They, they would conspire to to keep an accident secret. They had just come out and said there are too many people who just don't, who are too patriotic and don't really have a vested interest in getting themselves in trouble to keep to keep something that like that under wraps. But speaking of the Navy, there was a guy who was in the Navy who was uh, actually a United States SEAL, um, and uh, later maybe you saw him on TV because he was a professional wrestler and then somehow, through the miracles of the democratic process, became governor of Minnesota. Uh, Jesse Ventura won this in a very weird election. He was a complete outsider to, uh, to the whole political process, had no political power, and was able to basically pull, out, pull off a democratic, uh, almost a, a coup d'etat, almost. Uh, so some people came down and interviewed him afterwards, and they wanted to know how he did it. This is a Central Intelligence Agency. And this, it, it, there's, on YouTube, you can see this, where they're interviewing him. And uh, he says, yeah, they want to know how I pull it off. So clearly, if the CIA is interested in this, they want to apply that, apply that information elsewhere in their activities. Um, and uh, this is the beginning of the internet. Um, so I think that played some role in it. Uh, I'm not sure, and, and this segues into my point, the, uh, uh, I'm not sure if any of you heard the news recently, there's a woman who was uh, shamed, a woman from Iran who was shamed. Uh, they posted a, uh, uh, an interview with her where she confessed and they shamed her on TV. And there is a massive, this is very recent news, massive uh, amount of internet protest. And her crime was, she did what all teenagers do, which is videotape themselves doing silly stuff and posting it. She was dancing. <laughs> in Iran, it's illegal for women to dance, but they kind of let it, people do it privately. Well, she posted it, they shamed her, and there was huge outrage. Now, uh, this is unusual in a, uh, a, a country that's strictly controlled by the government. It's not unusual in China. You say anything, and you're going to be tried and re-educated. Um, this is uh, starting, it, we're a little closer to that in this country than you would believe. Uh, there are forces, uh, commercial forces, that really want to control what people see on the internet, and they do this uh, because it makes money for them. They want to charge people, and there's a, there is a movement afoot in the Trump, the whole uh, uh, Trump era, to give corporations whatever they want, including corporations the right to charge Google's amount of money for people in the same way that basic water is being taken over 
uh, water supply to the public is being taken over by corporations. They want to charge you like uh, like Charles talked about. The the rich want to charge you money to breathe the air. Well. Um, what I want to say is that it, this is something that should be seriously looked at. I really believe that, uh, that in a democracy, uh, access to information is critical for a democracy. You need an informed populace. It's one of the, it's one of the, 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 it's a thing that should be added to the basic human rights of people. It's, an, it's a 21st century addition that needs to be added. Um, to something that started with um, the Enlightenment, and uh, and I think that people should be aware of it and should fight for an open internet that uh, gives information to everybody. Thanks. Is that it? Oh, you're up. All right. Well, that wasn't too bad. That's the best you guys can do. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. No, thanks a lot. Okay, I'll go through some of these all together. We're all in this together. Yes, sir, we are. Some people don't realize that. They're in it for themselves, uh, particularly the free market capitalists. Uh, that's uh, something that compares the capitalists to think about or benefit I think it benefits anyone else. The butcher, yeah. the baker, and the candlestick members do not get up because they want yeah. to. They get up because they have a market that drives them. Yeah. And can, Unless they can and sell you something to make money. Here, what? Yeah. I don't know energy. I should go sit down. Well, I'll tell you about the energy return All investment right. later. All right, your baker and candlestick members. Yes. And Adam regarding Smith. information, yes. Um, yeah, I, I have to go to John. I think he spends a lot of time uh, gathering data and information and makes whatever he says to be that much more worthwhile. Maybe you guys could learn from that. You know, thank you very much. I just That's wonderful it. items. You know, uh, are we headed towards revolution? The guy who's saying, yeah, certainly. There, uh, I think the most telling figure is. Uh, most people are two weeks away from bankruptcy, if yes, I'm correct. That's right. An incident or illness or mm -hmm. layoff, and they uh, are in serious difficulties, and mortgage-wise, what have you. So, no, I don't think, I'm sorry, where's the guy that thinks this is the greatest country on earth? I don't think people, millions of people living on the precipice, uh, you know, is a wonderful condition. They are not, and plus, what's been going on in this nation in the past year or so is rather dis disarming. We've got a traitor <laughs> running this nation uh, who's destroying years of progressive policy. Uh, dark forces are operating. No, I'm not positive about it. That's all. Something should be done. And to say, well, oh, well it's really nice. Now, Dave, I, thanks for your comments, but are you saying that one country is better because they treat you nice? Do we treat people nice when we arrest them? How nice! <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad. You know. Hey, I might have gotten arrested, but hey, they were real nice about it. <laughs> they put the nicest guys you could ever find, you know. Hey, they put, you know, put me in jail, you know. Hey, they were, they were nice about it. <laughs> could, have been, could have been meaner, you know. But, you know. Uh, you know, regarding the middle class, um, that's, I began that social stratification, and I think I can agree here that, um, yeah, the, there is the haves and the have-nots. Uh, the figures just came out again, and upward the management employees of the United States are upwards of 400 times what the lowest person. So. It, the figures are going the wrong way. Um, regarding stories, there's all sorts of ambitious reporters. 
on looking to win publishing prizes. And yes, and editors will tell you, no, this is not the story we're going to print today. That's what editors do. I heard about a young college student complaining about that, that the editor of the school paper uh, nullified one of her stories. And I said, that's why you're in school to learn. That, you know, sometimes stories should in fact be canceled for any number of reasons. Uh, you've heard in a rebuttal right here regarding the Navy. Uh, matters of the sensitivity of shooting down airplanes, yes, is a pretty, pretty risky area to reporting on. And depending on the publication, yes, I would say we're not equipped or qualified or the version of truth on this. Yeah, I very well will kill the story myself. Uh, that's what I mean. There are certain stories. And basically, you can take it elsewhere. You can freelance your story wherever you like. But if you don't, if you don't feel, I always say, even in sending emails, yeah, there's a little bell goes off, and if there's something tells me this is maybe not the appropriate thing to do, I like to follow those senses. And yes, editors do that. Editors are paid to do that, to be reviewers. And you, as a reporter, no, I'm sorry. They get very enthusiastic. I was going to report it from the Philadelphia Choir, complaining about, she had the shittiest story. I'm not kidding, goofy. I go, oh, the editor told me to kill her. He's not going to bother with this anymore. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. I said, I wish he had done it about a month ago. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, thank you very much. I hope you caught something uh, out of this. And happy to see you day, everyone. All right. I want to close with that. I'm going to close with a quote, real quick. A quote. Many of you remember the illustrious Harry Callahan from the Dirty Harry movies. Was he French? No, but he closed out with it with something like this. We may not like the system we have, and until one comes along that's better, we best support the one we have. All right. And we're adjourned. <laughs> meeting adjourned. Can I use the hammer? Where's the meeting? Yeah, go ahead and use the hammer.